This audio production was made in collaboration with Audible Anarchist. Mutual Aid, A Factor of Evolution by Peter Kropotkin Chapter 4 Mutual Aid Among the Barbarians It is not possible to study primitive mankind without being deeply impressed by the sociability it has displayed since its very first steps in life. Traces of human societies are found in the relics of both the oldest and the later Stone Age. And when we come to observe the savages whose manners of life are still those of Neolithic man, we find them closely bound together by an extremely ancient clan organization, which enables them to combine their individually weak forces to enjoy life in common and to progress. Man is no exception in nature. He also is subject to the great principle of mutual aid, which grants the best chances of survival to those who best support each other in the struggle for life. These were the conclusions arrived at in the previous chapters. However, as soon as we come to a higher stage of civilization and refer to history which already has something to say about that stage, we are bewildered by the struggles and conflicts which it reveals. The old bonds seem entirely to be broken. Stems are seen to fight against stems, tribes against tribes, individuals against individuals, and out of this chaotic contest of hostile forces, mankind issues divided into castes, enslaved to despots, separated into states, always ready to wage war against each other. And with this history of mankind in his hands, the pessimist philosopher triumphantly concludes that warfare and oppression are the very essence of human nature, that the warlike and predatory instincts of man can only be restrained within certain limits by a strong authority which enforces peace and thus gives an opportunity to the few and nobler ones to prepare a better life for humanity in times to come. And yet... As soon as the everyday life of man during the historical period is submitted to a closer analysis, and so it has been, of late, by many patient students of very early institutions, it appears at once under quite a different aspect. Leaving aside the preconceived ideas of most historians and their pronounced predilection for the dramatic aspects of history, we see that the very documents they habitually peruse are such as to exaggerate the parts of human life given to struggles and to underrate its peaceful moods. The bright and sunny days are lost sight of in the gales and storms. Even in our time, the cumbersome records which we prepare for the future historian, in our press, our law courts, our government offices, and even in our fiction and poetry, suffer from the same one-sidedness. They hand down to posterity the most minute descriptions of every war every battle and skirmish, every contest and act of violence, every kind of individual suffering, but they hardly bear any trace of the countless acts of mutual support and devotion which every one of us knows from his own experience. They hardly take notice of what makes the very essence of our daily life, our social instincts and manners. No wonder, then, if the records of the past were so imperfect. The analysts of old never failed to chronicle the petty wars and calamities which harassed their contemporaries, but they paid no attention whatever to the life of the masses. Although the masses chiefly used to toil peacefully while the few indulged in fighting, the epic poems, the inscriptions on monuments, the treaties of peace, nearly all historical documents bear the same character. They deal with breaches of peace, not with peace itself so that the best-intentioned historian unconsciously draws a distorted picture of the times he endeavors to depict. And to restore the real proportions between conflict and union, we are now bound to enter into a minute analysis of thousands of small facts and faint indications accidentally preserved in the relics of the past. To interpret them with the aid of comparative ethnology and, after having heard so much about what used to divide men, to reconstruct stone by stone the institutions which used to unite them. Ere long, history will have to be rewritten on new lines so as to take into account these two currents of human life and to appreciate the part played by each of them in evolution. 
But in the meantime, we may avail ourselves of the immense preparatory work recently done towards restoring the leading features of the second current, so much neglected. From the better known periods of history, we may take some illustrations of the life of the masses, in order to indicate the part played by mutual support during those periods, and in so doing, we may dispense, for the sake of brevity, from going as far back as the Egyptian or even the Greek and Roman antiquity. For in fact, the evolution of mankind has not had the character of one unbroken series. Several times civilization came to an end in one given region, with one given race, and began anew elsewhere, among other races. But at each fresh start, it began again with the same clan institutions which we have seen among the savages. So that if we take the last start of our own civilization, when it began afresh in the first centuries of our era, among those whom the Romans called barbarians, we shall have the whole scale of evolution, beginning with the gents and ending in the institutions of our own time. To these illustrations, the following pages will be devoted. Men of science have not yet settled upon the courses which some 2,000 years ago drove whole nations from Asia into Europe, and resulted in the great migrations of barbarians which put an end to the West Roman Empire. One course, however, is naturally suggested to the geographer, as he contemplates the ruin of populous cities in the deserts of Central Asia, or follows the old beds of rivers now disappeared, and the wide outlines of lakes now reduced to the size of mere ponds. It is desiccation. A quite recent desiccation continued still at a speed which we formerly were not prepared to admit. Against it, man was powerless. When the inhabitants of northwest Mongolia and east Turkestan saw that water was abandoning them, they had no course open to them but to move down the broad valleys leading to the lowlands, and to thrust westwards the inhabitants of the plains. Stems after stems were thus thrown into Europe compelling other stems to move and to remove for centuries in succession, westwards and eastwards, in search of new and more or less permanent abodes. Races were mixing with races during those migrations, Aborigines with immigrants, Aryans with Ural Altaians, and it would have been no wonder if the social institutions which had kept them together in their mother countries had been totally wrecked during the stratification of races which took place in Europe and Asia but they were not wrecked. They simply underwent the modification which was required by the new conditions of life. The Teutons, the Celts, the Scandinavians, the Slavonians and others, when they first came in contact with the Romans, were in a transitional state of social organization. The clan unions, based upon a real or supposed common origin, had kept them together for many thousands of years in succession. But these unions could answer their purpose so long only as there were no separate families within the gens or clan itself. However, for causes already mentioned, the separate patriarchal family had slowly but steadily developed within the clans, and in the long run it evidently meant the individual accumulation of wealth and power, and the hereditary transmission of both. The frequent migrations of the barbarians and the ensuing wars only hastened the division of the gens into separate families, while the dispersing of stems and their mingling with strangers offered singular facilities for the ultimate disintegration of those unions which were based upon kinship. The barbarians thus stood in a position of either seeing their clans dissolved into loose aggregations of families, of which the wealthiest, especially if combining sacerdotal functions or military repute with wealth, would have succeeded in imposing their authority upon the others or of finding out some new form of organization based upon some new principle. Many stems had no force to resist disintegration. They broke up and were lost for history. But the more vigorous ones did not disintegrate. They came out of the ordeal with a new organization, the village community, which kept them together for the next 15 centuries or more. The conception of a common territory appropriated or protected by common efforts was elaborated and it took the place of the vanishing conceptions of common descent. The common gods gradually lost their character of ancestors and were endowed 
with a local territorial character. They became the gods or saints of a given locality. The land was identified with its inhabitants. Territorial unions grew up instead of the consanguine unions of old, and this new organization evidently offered many advantages under the given circumstances. He recognized the independence of the family, not even emphasized it, the village community disclaiming all rights of interference in what was going on within the family enclosure. It gave much more freedom to personal initiative. It was not hostile in principle to union between men of different descent, and it maintained at the same time the necessary cohesion of action and thought. While it was strong enough to oppose the dominative tendencies of the minorities of wizards, priests, and professional or distinguished warriors, consequently, it became the primary cell of future organization, and with many nations the village community has retained this character until now. It is now known, and scarcely contested, that the village community was not a specific feature of the Slavonians, nor even of the ancient Teutons. It prevailed in England during both the Saxon and Norman times, and partially survived till the last century. It was at the bottom of the social organization of old Scotland, Old Ireland and Old Wales. In France, the communal possession and the communal allotment of arable land by the village folk moat persisted from the first centuries of our era till the times of Turgot, who found the folk moats too noisy and therefore, abol therefore abolished them. It survived Roman rule in Italy and revived after the fall of the Roman Empire. It was the rule with the Scandinavians, the Slavonians, the Finns in the Piteia as also probably the Kilakunta, the courses and the lives. The village community in India, past and present, Aryan and non-Aryan, is well known through the epoch-making works of Sir Henry Maine, and Elphinstone has described it among the Afghans. We also find it in the Mongolian Ulus, the Kabyle Tadart, and Javanese Dessa, the Malayan Kota or Tofa, and under a variety of names in Abyssinia, the Sudan, in the interior of Africa, with natives of both Americas, with all the small and large tribes of the Pacific archipelagos. In short, we do not know one single human race or one single nation which has not had its periods of village communities. This fact alone disposes of the theory according to which the village community in Europe would have been a servile growth. It is anterior to serfdom, and even servile submission was powerless to break it. It was a universal phase of evolution, a natural outcome of the clan organization with all those stems, at least, which have played or play still some part in history. It was a natural growth, and an absolute uniformity in its structure was therefore not possible. As a rule, it was a union between families considered as of common descent and owning a certain territory in common. But with those stems, and under certain circumstances, the families used to grow very numerous before they threw off new buds in the shape of new families. Five, six, or seven generations continued to live under the same roof, or within the same enclosure, owning their joint household and cattle in common, and taking their meals at the common hearth. They kept in such case to what ethnology knows as the joint family, or the undivided household which we still see all over China, in India, in the South Slavonian Zadruga, and occasionally find in Africa, in America, in Denmark, in North Russia, and West France. With other stems, or in other circumstances, not yet well specified, the families did not attain the same proportions. The grandsons and occasionally the sons left the household as soon as they were married, and each of them started a new cell of his own. But joint or not joint, Clustered together or scattered in the woods, the families remained united into village communities. Several villages were grouped into tribes, and the tribes joined into confederations. Such was the social organization which developed among the so-called barbarians, when they began to settle more or less permanently in Europe. A very long evolution was required before the gents, clans, recognized the separate existence of a patriarchal family in a separate hut. But even after that had been recognized, the clan, as a rule, knew no personal inheritance or property. 
The few things which might have belonged personally to the individual were either destroyed on his grave or buried with him. The village community, on the contrary, fully recognized the private accumulation of wealth within the family and its hereditary transmission. But wealth was conceived exclusively in the shape of movable property, including cattle, implements, arms, and the dwelling house, which, like all things that can be destroyed by fire, belonged to the same category. As to private property and land, the village community did not and could not recognize anything of the kind, and as a rule, it does not recognize it now. The land was the common property of the tribe, or of the whole stem, and the village community itself owned its part of the tribal territory, so long only as the tribe did not claim a redistribution of the village allotments. The clearing of the woods and the breaking of the prairies being mostly done by the communities or, at least, by the joint work of several families. Always with the consent of the community. The cleared plots were held by each family for a term of four, twelve or twenty years, after which term they were treated as part of the arable land owned in common. Private property, or the possession forever, was incompatible with the very principle and the religious conceptions of the village community, as it was with the principles of the gents, so that a long influence of the Roman law and the Christian church, which soon accepted the Roman principles, were required to accustom the barbarians to the idea of private property in land being possible. And yet, even when such property or possession for an unlimited time was recognized, the owner of a separate estate remained a co-proprietor in the wastelands, forests and grazing grounds. Moreover, we continually see, especially in the history of Russia, that when a few families, acting separately, had taken possession of some land belonging to tribes which were treated as strangers, they were soon united together and constituted a village community which in the third or fourth generation began to profess a community of origin. A whole series of institutions, partly inherited from the clan period, have developed from the basis of common ownership of land during the long succession of centuries, which was required to bring the barbarians under the domination of states organized upon the Roman or Byzantine pattern. The village community was not only a union for guaranteeing to each one his fair share in the common land, but also a union for common culture, for mutual support in all possible forms, for protection from violence and for a further development of knowledge, national bonds and moral conceptions. And every change in the judicial, military, educational or economical manners had to be decided at the folk modes of the village, the tribe or the confederation. The community being a continuation of the gens, it inherited all its functions. It was the universitas, the mere, a world in itself. Common hunting, common fishing, and common culture of the orchards of the plantations of fruit trees was the rule with the old gens. Common agriculture became the rule in the barbarian village communities. True, that direct testament to this effect is scarce, and in the literature of antiquity we only have the passages of Diodorus and Julius Caesar relating to the inhabitants of the Lipari Islands, one of the Celt-Iberian tribes, and the Suevs. But there is no lack of evidence to prove that common agriculture was practiced among some Teuton tribes, the Franks, and the old Scotch, Irish, and Welsh. As to the later survivals of the same practice, Simply, they simply are countless. Even in perfectly Romanized France, common culture was habitual some five and twenty years ago in the Morbihan, Brittany, the old Welsh Sivar, or joint team, as well as the common culture of the land allotted to the use of the village sanctuary are quite common among the tribes of Caucasus, at least touched, the least touched by civilization. And like facts are of daily occurrence among the Russian peasants. Moreover, it is well known that many tribes of Brazil, Central America and Mexico used to cultivate their fields in common, and that the same habit is widely spread among some Malayans in New Caledonia with several Negro stems and so on. In short, communal culture is so habitual with many Aryan, Uraltean, Mongolian, Negro, Red Indian, Malayan and Melanesian stems 
that we must consider it a universal, though not as the only possible, form of primitive agriculture. Communal cultivation does not, however, imply by necessity communal consumption. Already under the clan organization, we often see that when the boats laden with fruits or fish return to the village, the food they bring in is divided among the huts and the longhouses, inhabited by either several families or the youth, and is cooked separately at each separate hearth. The habit of taking meals in a narrow circle of relatives or associates that prevails at an early period of clan life. It became the rule in the village community. Even the food grown in common was usually divided between the households after part of it had been laid in store for communal use. However, the tradition of communal meals was piously kept alive. Every available opportunity, such as the commemoration of the ancestors, the religious festivals, the beginning and the end of fieldwork, the births, the marriages and the funerals, being seized upon to bring the community to a common meal. Even now this habit, well known in this country as the harvest supper, is the last to disappear. On the other hand, even when the fields had long since ceased to be tilled and sown in common, a variety of agricultural work continued, and continues still, to be performed by the community. Some part of the communal land is still cultivated, in many cases, in common, either for the use of the destitute, or for refilling the communal stores, or for using the produce at the religious festivals. The irrigation canals are digged and repaired in common. The communal meadows are mown by the community, and the sight of a rough Russian commune mowing a meadow the men rivaling each other in their advance with the scythe, while the women turn the grass over and throw it up into heaps, is one of the most inspiring sights. It shows what human work might be and ought to be. The hay in such case is divided among the separate households, and it is evident that no one has the right of taking hay from a neighbor's stack without his permission. But the limitation of this last rule among the Caucasian or sets is most noteworthy. When the cuckoo cries and announces that spring is coming and that the meadows will soon be clothed again with grass, everyone in need has the right of taking from a neighbor's stack the hay he wants for his cattle. The old communal rights are thus reasserted, as if to prove how contrary unbridled individualism is to human nature. When the European traveller lands in some small island of the Pacific, and seeing at a distance a grove of palm trees, walks in that direction, he is astonished to discover that the little villages are connected by roads, paved with big stones, quite comfortable for the unshod natives, and very similar to the old roads of the Swiss mountains. Such roads were traced by the barbarians all over Europe, and one must have travelled in wild, thinly populated countries, far away from the chief lines of communication, to realize in full the immense work that must have been performed by the barbarian communities in order to conquer the woody and marshy wilderness which Europe was some two thousand years ago. Isolated families, having no tools, and weak as they were, could not have conquered it. The wilderness would have overpowered them. Village communities alone, working in common, could master the wild forests, the sinking marshes, and the endless steppes. The rough roads, the ferries, the wooden bridges, taken away in the winter and rebuilt after the spring flood was over, the fences and the palisade walls of the villages, the earthen forts and the small towers with which the territory was dotted, all these were the work of the barbarian communities. And when a community grew numerous, it used to throw off a new bud, a new community arose at a distance. Thus, step by step, bringing the woods and the steppes under the dominion of man. The whole making of European nations was such a budding of the village communities. Even nowadays, the Russian peasants, if they are not quite broken down by misery, migrate in communities, and they till the soil and build the houses in common when they settle on the banks of the Amur or in Manitoba. And even the English, when they first began to colonize America, used to return to the old system they grouped into village communities. The village community was the chief arm of the barbarians in their hard struggle against a hostile nature. It also was the bond they 
opposed to oppression by the cunningest and the strongest which so easily might have developed during those disturbed times. The imaginary barbarian, the man who fights and kills at his mere caprice, existed no more than the bloodthirsty savage. The real barbarian was living, on the contrary, under a wide series of institutions, imbued with considerations as to what may be useful or noxious to his tribe or confederation. And these institutions were piously handed down from generation to generation, in verses and songs, in proverbs or triads, in sentences and instructions. The more we study them, the more we recognize the narrow bonds which united men in their villages, Every quarrel arising between two individuals was treated as a communal affair. Even the offensive words that might have been uttered during a quarrel being considered as an offense to the community and its ancestors. They had to be repaired by amends made both to the individual and the community. And if a quarrel ended in a fight and wounds, the man who stood by and did not interpose was treated as if he himself had inflicted the wounds. The judicial procedure was imbued with the same spirit. Every dispute was brought first before mediators or arbiters, and it mostly ended with them, the arbiters playing a very important part in barbarian society. But if the case was too grave to be settled in this way, it came before the folk mode, which was bound to find the sentence, and pronounced it in a conditional form, that is, such compensation was due if the wrong be proved, and the wrong had to be proved or disclaimed by six or twelve persons confirming or denying the fact by oath ordeal being resorted to in case of contraction between the two sets of jurors. Such procedure, which remained in force for more than 2,000 years in between all members of the community. Moreover, there was no other authority to enforce the decisions of the folk mode besides its own moral authority. The only possible menace was that the community might declare the rebel an outlaw, but even this menace was reciprocal. A man discontested with a folk mode could declare that he would abandon the tribe and go over to another tribe, a most dreadful menace, as it was sure to bring all kinds of misfortunes upon a tribe that might have been unfair to one of its members. A rebellion against the right decision of the customary law was simply inconceivable, as Henry Maine has so well said, because law, morality and fact could not be separated from each other in those times. The moral authority of the commune was so great that even at a much later epoch, when the village communities fell into submission to the feudal lord, they maintained their judicial powers. They only permitted the lord or his deputy to find the above conditional sentence in accordance with the customary law he had sworn to follow, and to levy for himself the fine, the fred, due to the commune. But for a long time the lord himself, if he remained a co-proprietor in the wasteland of the commune, submitted in communal affairs to its decision. Noble or ecclesiastic, he had to submit to the folk mode. Wer das selbst Wasser und weist genusst, muss gehorsam sein. Who enjoys here the right of water and pasture must obey, was the old saying. Even when the peasants became serfs under the Lord, he was bound to appear before the folk mode when they summoned him. In the conceptions of justice, the barbarians evidently did not much differ from the savages. They also maintained the idea that a murderer must be followed by putting the murderer to death, that wounds had to be punished by equal wounds, and that the wronged family was bound to fulfill the sentence of the customary law. This was a holy duty, a duty towards the ancestors, which had to be accomplished in broad daylight, never in secrecy, and rendered widely known. Therefore, the most inspired passages of the sagas and epic poetry altogether are those which glorify what was supposed to be justice. The gods themselves joined in adding it, aiding it. However, the predominant feature of barbarian justice, on the other, one hand, to limit the numbers of persons who may be involved in a feud, and on the other hand, to extirpate the brutal idea of blood for blood and wounds for wound by substituting for it the system of compensation. The barbarian codes, which were collections of common law rules written down for the use of judges, first permitted, then encouraged, and at last enforced, compensation instead of revenge. The compensation has, however, been totally misunderstood by those who represented it as a fine, and as a sort of carte blanche given to the rich man to do whatever he liked. 
The compensation money, vergeld, which was quite different from the fine or fred, was habitually so high for all kinds of active offences that it certainly was no encouragement for such offences. In case of a murder, it usually exceeded all the possible fortune of the murderer. Eighteen times eighteen cows is a compensation with the Ossets, who do not know how to reckon above eighteen, while with the African tribes it attains eight hundred cows or one hundred camels with their young, or four hundred sixteen sheep in the poorer tribes. In the great majority of cases the compensation money could not be paid at all, so that the murderer had to issue but to induce the wronged family by repentance to adopt him. Even now in the Caucasus, when feuds come to an end, the offender touches with his lips the breast of the older woman of the tribe and becomes a milk brother to all men of the wrong family. With several African tribes, he must give his daughter or sister in marriage to someone of the family with other tribes he is bound to marry the woman whom he has made a widow. And in all cases, he becomes a member of the family whose opinion is taken in all important family matters. Far from acting... With disregard to human life, the barbarians, moreover, knew nothing of the horrid punishments introduced at a later epoch by the laic and canonic laws under Roman and Byzantine influence. For if the Saxon code admitted the death penalty rather freely, even in cases of incendiarism and armed robbery, the other barbarian codes pronounced it exclusively in cases of betrayal of one's kin, a sacrilege against the community's gods as the only means to appease the gods. All this, as seen, is very far from the supposed moral dissoluteness of the barbarians. On the contrary, we cannot but admire the deeply moral principles elaborated within the early village communities, which found their expression in Welsh triads, in legends about King Arthur, in Brehon commentaries, in old German legends, and so on or find still their expression in the sayings of the modern barbarians. In his introduction to The Story of Burnt Njal, George Dawson very justly sums up as follows the qualities of a Northman, as they appear in the sagas. To do what lay before him openly and like a man, without fear of either foes, fiends, or faith. To be free and daring in all his deeds, to be gentle and generous to his friends and kinsmen, to be stern and grim to his foes, those who are under the lex talionis, but even towards them to fulfill all bounden duties, to be no truce-breaker, nor tale-bearer, nor backbiter, to utter nothing against any man that he would not dare to tell him to his face, to turn no man from his door who sought food or shelter, even though he were a foe. The same or still better principles permeate the Welsh epic poetry and triads. To act according to the nature of mildness and the principles of equity, without regard to the foes or to the friends, and to repair the wrong, are the highest duties of man. Evil is death, good is life, exclaims the poetic legislator. The world would be fool if agreements made on lips were not honourable, the Brehan law says. And the humble shamanist Mordovian, after having praised the same qualities, will add, Moreover, in his principles of customary law that among neighbours the cow and the milking jar are in common, that the cow must be milked for yourself and him who may ask milk, that the body of a child reddens from the stroke, but the face of him who strikes reddens from shame, and so on. Many pages might be filled with the like principles expressed and followed by the barbarians. One feature more of the old village communities deserves a special mention. It is the gradual extension of the circle of men embraced by the feelings of solidarity. Not only the tribes federated into stems, but the stems as well, even though of different origin, joined together in confederations. Some unions were so close that, for instance, the Vandals, after part of their confederation, had left for the Rhine, and thence went over to Spain and Africa, respected for forty consecutive years the landmarks and the abandoned villages of their confederates and did not take possession of them until they had ascertained through envoys that their confederates did not intend to return. With other barbarians, the soil was cultivated by one part of the stem, while the other part fought on or beyond the frontiers of the common territory. As to the leagues between several stems, they were quite habitual. The Sicambers united with the Cheruskis and the Suebs and the Quads 
with the Sarmites, the Sarmites with the Alans, the Carps and the Huns. Later on, we also see the conception of nations gradually developing in Europe, long before anything like a state had grown in any part of the continent occupied by the barbarians. These nations for it is impossible to refuse the name of a nation to the Merovingian France or to the Russia of the 11th and 12th century, were nevertheless kept together by nothing else but a community of language and a tacit agreement of the small republics to take their dukes from none but one special family. Wars were certainly unavoidable. Migration means war. But Sir Henry Maine has already fully proved in his remarkable study of the tribal origin of international law that Man has never been so ferocious or so stupid as to submit to such an evil as war without some kind of effort to prevent it. And he has shown how exceedingly great is the number of ancient institutions which bear the marks of a design to stand in the way of war or to provide an alternative to it. In reality, man is so far from the warlike being he is supposed to be that when the barbarians had once settled, they so rapidly lost the very habits of warfare that very soon they were compelled to keep special dukes followed by special scholae or bands of warriors in order to protect them from possible intruders. They preferred peaceful toil to war, the very peacefulness of man being the cause of the specialization of the warrior's trade, which specialization resulted later on in serfdom in all the wars of the state's period of human history. History finds great difficulties in restoring to life the institutions of the barbarians. At every step the historian meets with some faint indication which he is unable to explain with the aid of his own documents alone. But a broad light is thrown on the past as soon as we refer to the institutions of the very numerous tribes which are still living under a social organization almost identical with that of our barbarian ancestors. Here we simply have the difficulty of choice because the islands of the Pacific the steppes of Asia and the tablelands of Africa are real historical museums containing specimens of all possible intermediate stages which mankind has lived through when passing from the savage gens up to the state's organization. Let us then examine a few of those specimens. If we take the village communities of the Mongol Buryats, especially those of the Kundisk steppe on the upper Lena, which have better escaped Russian influence, we have fair representatives of barbarians in a transitional state between cattle breeding and agriculture. These Buryats are still living in joint families, that is, although each son, when he is married, goes to live in a separate hut, the huts of at least three generations remain within the same enclosure, and the joint family work in common in their fields, and own in common their joint households and their cattle, as well as their calves' grounds small fence in patches of soil kept on the soft grass for the rearing of calves. As a rule, the meals are taken separately in each hut, but when meat is roasted, all the twenty or sixty members of the joint household feasts together. Several joint households which live in a cluster, as well as several smaller families settled in the same village, mostly debris of joint households accidentally broken up, make the ulus, or the village community. Several Uluses make a tribe, and 46 tribes or clans of the Kudinsk steppe are united into one confederation. Smaller and closer confederations are entered into, as necessity arises for special wants, but several tribes. They know no private property in land, the land being held in common by the Ulus, or rather by the confederation. And if it becomes necessary, the territory is reallotted between the different Uluses at a folk moat of the tribe and between the 46 tribes at a folk moat of the confederation, it is worthy of note that the same organization prevails among all the 250,000 Buryats of East Siberia. Although they have been for three centuries under Russian rule and are well acquainted with Russian institutions. With all that, inequalities of fortune rapidly develop among the Buryats, especially since the Russian government is giving exaggerated importance to their elected Taishas, princes whom it considers as responsible tax collectors and representatives of the confederation in their administrative and even commercial relations with the Russians. The channels for the enrichment of the few are thus many, while the impoverishment of the great number goes hand in hand through the appropriation of the Buryat lands by the Russians. 
but it is a habit with the Buryats, especially those of Kudinsk, and habit is more than law, that if a family has lost its cattle, the richer families give it some cows and horses that it may recover. As to the destitute man who has no family, he takes his meals in the huts of the congeners. He enters a hut, takes by right, not for charity, his seat by the fire, and shares the meal which always is scrupulously divided into equal parts. He sleeps where he has taken his evening meal. Altogether, the Russian conquerors of Siberia were so much struck by the communistic practices of the Buryats that they gave them the name Bratskie, the brotherly ones, and reported to Moscow, With them everything is in common, whatever they have is shared in common. Even now, when the Lena Buryats sell their wheat or send some of their cattle to be sold to a Russian brother, the families of the Ulos, or the tribe, put their wheat and cattle together and sell it as a whole. Each Ulos has, moreover, its grain store for loans in case of need, its communal baking oven, the four banal of the old French communities, and its blacksmith, who, like the blacksmith of the Indian communities, being a member of the community, is never paid for his work within the community. He must make it for nothing, and if he utilizes his spare time for fabricating the small plates of chiseled and silvered iron, which are used by buried land for the decoration of dress, he may occasionally sell them to a woman from another clan, but to the women of his own clan the attire is presented as a gift. Selling and buying cannot take place within the community, and the rule is so severe that when a richer family hires a laborer, the laborer must be taken from another clan or from among the Russians. This habit is evidently not specific to the Buryats. It is so widely spread among the modern barbarians, Aryan and Uraltaian, that it must have been universal among our ancestors. The feeling of union within the confederation is kept alive by the common interests of the tribes, the folk mo their folk modes and the festivities which are usually kept in connection with the folk modes. The same feeling is, however, maintained by another institution, the Aba, or common hut, which is a reminiscence of a very remote past. Every autumn, the 46 clans of Kudinsk come together for such a hunt, the produce of which is divided among all the families. Moreover, national Abbas, to assert the unity of the whole Buryat nation, are convoked from time to time in such cases, all Buryat clans, which are scattered for hundreds of miles west and east of Lake Baikal, are bound to send their delegate hunters. Thousands of men come together, each one bringing provisions for a whole month. Everyone's share must be equal to all the others, and therefore, before being put together, they are weighed by an elected elder. Always with a hand, scales would be a profanation of the old custom. After that, the hunters divide into bands of twenty, and the parties go hunting according to a well-settled plan. In such a bas, the entire Buryat nation revives its epic traditions of a time when it was united in a powerful league. Let me add that such communal hunts are quite usual with the Red Indians and the Chinese on the banks of the Usuri, the Kada. With the Kabyles, whose manners of life have been so well described by two French explorers, we have barbarians still more advanced in agriculture. Their fields, irrigated and manured, are well attended to, and in the hilly tracts every available plot of land is cultivated by the spade. The Kabyles have known many vicissitudes in their history. They have followed for some time the Muslim law of inheritance. But being adverse to it, they have returned 150 years ago to the tribal customary law of old. According to their land tenure, is of a mixed character, and private property and land exist side by side with communal possession. Still, the basis of their present organization is the village community, the Thadart, which usually consists of several joint families, Karubas, claiming a community of origin, as well as of smaller families of strangers. Several villages are grouped into clans or tribes, Arh. Several tribes make the confederation, Takebilt, and several confederations may occasionally enter into a league, chiefly for purposes of armed defense. The Kabyles know no authority, whatever, besides that of the Gemma, or folk mode, of the village community. All men of age take part in it, 
in the open air or in a special building provided with stone seats, and the decisions of the jama are evidently taken at unanimity. That is, the discussions continue until all present agree to accept or to submit to some decision. There being no authority in a village community to impose a decision, the system has been practiced by mankind wherever there have been village communities, and it is practiced still wherever they continue to exist i.e. by several hundred million men all over the world. The Jamma nominates its executive, the elder, the scribe, and the treasurer. It assesses its own taxes, and it manages the repartition of the common lands, as well as all kinds of works of public utility. A great deal of work is done in common. The roads, the mosques, the fountains, the irrigation canals, the towers erected for protection from robbers, the fences, and so on, are built by the village community, while the high roads, the larger mosques, and the great marketplaces are the work of the tribe. Many traces of common culture continue to exist, and the houses continue to be built by or with the aid of all men and women of the village. Altogether, the aids are of daily occurrence and are continually called in for the cultivation of the fields, for harvesting and so on. As is skilled work, each community has its blacksmith, who enjoys his part of the communal land, and works for the community. When the tilling season approaches, he visits every house and repairs the tools and the plows, without expecting any pay, while the making of new plows is considered as a pious work which can by no means be recompensed in money or by any other form of salary. As the Kabyles already have private property, they evidently have both rich and poor among them, but like all people who closely live together and know how poverty begins, they considered it as an accident which may visit everyone. Don't say that you will never wear the beggar's bag, nor go to prison, is a proverb of the Russian peasants. The cabals practice it, and no difference can be detected in the external behavior between rich and poor. When the poor convokes an aid, the rich man works in his field just as the poor man does it reciprocally in return. Moreover, the Jamas set aside certain gardens and fields, sometimes cultivated in common for the use of the poorest members. Many like customs continue to exist. As the poorer families would not be able to buy meat, meat is regularly bought with the money of the fines, or the gifts to the Jama, or the payments for the use of the communal olive oil basins, and it is distributed in equal parts among those who cannot afford buying meat themselves. And when a sheep or a bullock is killed by a family for its own use on a day which is not a market day, the fact is announced in the streets by the village crier, in order that sick people and pregnant women may take of it what they want. Mutual support permeates the life of the cabals, and if one of them during a journey abroad meets with another cabal in need, he is bound to come to his aid, even at the risk of his own fortune and life. If this has not been done, the Jemma of the man who has suffered from such neglect may lodge a complaint with the Jemma of the selfish man, will at once make good the loss. We thus come across a custom which is familiar to the students of the medieval merchant guilds. Every stranger who enters a Kabal village has a right to housing in the winter, and his horses can always graze on the communal lands for twenty-four hours but in case of need he can reckon upon an almost unlimited support. Thus, during the famine of 1867-68, to 68, the cabals received and fed every one who sought refuge in their villages, without distinction of origin. In the district of Delis, no less than 12,000 people who came from all parts of Algeria and even from Morocco were fed in this way. While people died from starvation all over Algeria, there was not one single case of death due to this cause on Kabylian soil. The Jemmas, depriving themselves of necessaries, organized relief without ever asking any aid from the government, or uttering the slightest complaint. They considered it as a natural duty. And while among the European settlers all kind of police measures were taken to prevent thefts and disorder resulting from an influx of strangers, nothing of the kind was required of the Kabbal's territory. The Jemmas needed neither aid nor protection from without. I can only cursorily mention two other most interesting features of Kabbal life, namely the Anaya, or protection granted to wells, canals, mosques, marketplaces, some roads, and so on, in case of war. 
the Kofs, in the Anaya, we have a series of institutions, both diminishing the evils of war and for preventing conflicts. Thus, the marketplace is Anaya, especially if it stands on a frontier and brings cabals and strangers together. No one dares disturb peace in the market, and if a disturbance arises, it is quelled at once by the strangers who have gathered in the market town. The road upon which the women go from the village to the fountain also is Anaya, in case of war, and so on. As to the cough, it is widely spread from an association having some characters of the medieval Bürgschaften, or Gegilden, as well as of societies both for mutual protection and for various purposes, intellectual, political, and emotional, which cannot be satisfied by the territorial organization of the village, the clan, and the confederation. The cough knows no territorial limits. It recruits its members in various villages, even among strangers, and it protects them in all possible eventualities of life. Altogether, it is an attempt at supplementing the territorial grouping by an extraterritorial grouping intended to give an expression to mutual affinities of all kinds across the frontiers. The free international association of individual tastes and ideas, which we consider as one of the best features of our own life, has thus its origin in barbarian antiquity. The mountaineers of Caucasia offer another extremely instructive field for illustrations of the same kind. In studying the present customs of the Ossets, their joint families and communes, and their judiciary conceptions, Professor Kovalevsky, in a remarkable work on modern customs and ancient law, I was enabled step by step to trace the similar dispositions of the old barbarian codes and even to study the origins of feudalism. With other Caucasian stems, we occasionally catch a glimpse into the origin of the village community in those cases where it was not tribal but originated from a voluntary union between families of distinct origin. Such was recently the case with Khefsure villages, the inhabitants of which took the oath of community and fraternity. In another part of Caucasus, Dagestan, we see the growth of feudal relations between two tribes, both maintaining at the same time their village communities and even traces of the Gentile classes, and thus giving a living illustration of the forms taken by the conquest of Italy and Gaul by the barbarians. The victorious race, the Lejgins, who have conquered several Georgian and Tartar villages in the Sakatali district, did not bring them under the dominion of separate families. They constituted a feudal clan which now includes 12,000 households in three villages and owns in common no less than 20 Georgian and Tartar villages. The conquerors divided their own land among their clans and the clans divided it in equal parts among the families. But they did not interfere with the Gemmas of their tributaries, which still practice the habit mentioned by Julius Caesar, namely the Gemma decides each year which part of the communal territory must be cultivated. And this land is divided into as many parts as there are families, and the parts are distributed by lot. It is worthy of note that although proletarians are of common occurrence among the Lejrins, who live under a system of private property and land and common ownership of serfs, they are rare among their Georgian serfs, who continue to hold their land in common. As to the customary law of the Caucasian mountaineers, it is much the same as that of the Longobards or Salic Franks, and several of its dispositions explain a good deal the judicial procedure of the barbarians of old. Being of a very impressionable character, they do their best to prevent quarrels from taking a fatal issue. So with the Khevsors, the swords are very soon drawn when a quarrel breaks out. But if a woman rushes out and throws among them the piece of linen which she wears on her head, the swords are at once returned to their sheaths, and the quarrel is appeased. The headdress of the woman is Anaya. If a quarrel has not been stopped in time and has ended in murder, the compensation money is so considerable that the aggressor is entirely ruined for his life unless he is adopted by the wrong family. And if he has resorted to his sword in a trifling quarrel and its inflicted wounds, he loses forever the consideration of his kin. In all disputes, mediators take the matter in hand. 
They select from among the members of the clan the judges, six in smaller affairs and from ten to fifteen in more serious matters. And Russian observers testify to the absolute incorruptibility of the judges. An oath has such a significance that men enjoying general esteem are dispensed from taking it. A simple affirmation is quite sufficient. The more so as in grave affairs the Khevsura never hesitates to recognize his guilt. I mean, of course, the Khevsura untouched yet by civilization. The oath is chiefly reserved for such cases like disputes about property which requires some sort of appreciation in addition to a simple statement of facts. In such cases, the men whose affirmations will decide in the dispute act with the greatest circumspection, although it is certainly not a want of honesty or of respect to the rights of the congeners, which characterizes the barbarian societies of the Caucasus. The stems of Africa offer such an immense variety of extremely interesting societies standing at all intermediate stages from the early village community to the despotic barbarian monarchies that I must abandon the idea of giving here even the chief results of a comparative study of their institutions. Suffice it to say that even under the most horrid despotism of kings, the folk modes of the village communities and their customary law remain sovereign in a wide circle of affairs. The law of the state allows the king to take anyone's life for a simple caprice, or even for simply satisfying his gluttony. But the customary law of the people continues to maintain the same network of institutions for mutual support which exist among other barbarians or have existed among our ancestors. And when some better favoured stems in Bornu, Uganda, Abyssinia, and especially the Bogos, some of the dispositions of the customary law are inspired with really graceful and delicate feelings. The village community of the natives of both Americas have the same character. The Tupi of Brazil were found living in longhouses occupied by whole clans which used to cultivate their corn and manioc fields in common. The Arani, much more advanced in civilization, used to cultivate their fields in common. So also the Ukagas, who had learned under their system of primitive communism and longhouses to build good roads and to carry on a variety of domestic industries, not inferior to those of the early medieval times in Europe. All of them were also living under the same customary law of which we have given specimens on the preceding pages. At another extremity of the world we find the Malayan feudalism, but this feudalism has been powerless to unroot the Nagaria, or village community, with its common ownership of at least part of the land and the redistribution of land among the several Nagarias of the tribe. With the Alfuros of Minahasa, we find the communal rotation of the crops. With the Indian stem of the Wyandots, we have the periodical redistribution of land within the tribe and the clan culture of the soil. And in all those parts of Sumatra, where Muslim institutions have not yet totally destroyed the old organization, we find the joint family, Sukha, and the village community, Kota, which maintains its right upon the land, even if part of it has been cleared without its authorization. But to say this is to say that all customs for mutual protection and prevention of feuds and wars, which have been briefly indicated in the preceding pages as characteristic of the village community, exist as well. More than that, the more fully the communal possession of land has been maintained, the better and the gentler are the habits. The, st the Stuers positively affirms that wherever the institution of the village community has been less encroached upon by the conquerors, the inequalities of fortunes are smaller, and the very prescriptions of the lex talionis are less cruel. While on the contrary, wherever the village community has been totally broken up, the inhabitants suffered the most unbearable oppression from their despotic rulers. This is quite natural. And when Waits made the remark that those stems which have maintained their tribal confederations stand on a higher level of development and have a richer literature than those stems which have forfeited the old bonds of union, he only pointed out what might have been foretold in advance. More illustrations would simply involve me in tedious repetitions. So strikingly similar are the barbarian societies under all climates and amidst all races. 
The pro same process of evolution has been going on in mankind with a wonderful similarity. When the clan organization, assailed as it was from within by the separate family, and from without by the dismemberment of the migrating clans and the necessity of taking in strangers of different descent, the village community, based upon a territorial conception, came into existence. This new institution, which had naturally grown out of the preceding one, the clan, permitted the barbarians to pass through a most disturbed period of history without being broken into isolated families, which would have succumbed in the struggle for life. New forms of culture developed under the new organization. Agriculture attained the state which it hardly has surpassed until now with a great number. The domestic industries reached a high degree of perfection. The wilderness was conquered. It was intersected by roads, dotted with swarms thrown off by the mother communities. Markets and fortified centers, as well as places of public worship, were erected. The conceptions of a wider union, extended to whole stems, and to several stems of various origin, were slowly elaborated. The old conceptions of justice, which were conceptions of mere revenge, slowly underwent a deep modification. The idea of amends for the wrong done taking the place of revenge. The customary law, which still makes the law of the daily life for two-thirds or more of mankind, was elaborated under that organization, as well as a system of habits intended to prevent the opp oppression of the masses by the minorities, whose powers grew in proportion to the growing facilities for private accumulation of wealth. This was the new form taken by the tendencies of the masses for mutual support, and the progress, economical, intellectual and moral, which mankind accomplished under this new popular form of organization, was so great that the states, when they were called later on into existence, simply took possession in the interest of the minorities of all the judicial, economical and administrative functions which the village community already had exercised in the interest of all. This has been a production of Audible Anarchist. You can find more Audible Anarchist on YouTube.